Section One of the Poetry of Sardi, a Selection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. A Selection from the Poetry of Sardi Shirazi, edited by Nathan Haskell Doll and Bell Walker. Biography of Sadi Sheikh Sadi, the nightingale of Shiraz, as Jami poetically calls this gifted poet, was born at Shiraz, the capital of Persia, near the end of the twelfth century. All biographers agree that he lived to be over a hundred years old, Dawlut Shah even crediting him with a hundred and twenty years. Sheikh Musli ud Din for that is Saadi's real name, was patronized by Atabak Saad ibn Zangi, the viceroy of Persia, hence his Takkalus, Saadi, to which was added, as a great honor, the title of Sheikh. At this time, the college at Baghdad was the great educational center of the East, and there Saadi was educated. He was of a religious temperament, and is said to have made fourteen pilgrimages to Mecca. These journeys took place during the second period of his life, for most writers divide Saadi's life into three parts. The first, devoted to study, the second, to travel, and the third, to seclusion, for at Shiraz he built himself a hermitage, and there, when over sixty, he devoted himself to his great literary career. Emerson, commenting on his varied experience, says, By turns, a student, a water carrier, a traveller, a soldier fighting against the Christians in the Crusades, a prisoner employed to dig trenches before Tripoli, and an honoured poet in his protracted old age at home, his varied and severe experience took away all provincial tone, and gave him a facility for speaking to all conditions. But the commanding reason of his wider popularity is his deeper sense, which, in his treatment, expands the local forms and tints to a cosmopolitan breadth. Through his Persian dialect, he speaks to all nations, and, like Homer, Shakespeare, Cervantes, and Montaigne, is perpetually modern. Indeed, he has furnished the originals of a multitude of tales and proverbs which are current in our mouths, and attributed by us to recent writers, as, for example, the story of Abraham and the fire worshippers, once claimed for Dr. Franklin and afterwards traced to Jeremy Taylor, who probably found it in Oliarius. His works number 24. Among those best known are the Gulistan, or Rose Garden, and the Bustan, or The Garden of Perfume. The Gulistan is a collection of short, pithy stories, based on Saadi's own varied experiences, and read, it is said, from the middle of China to the extreme corners of Africa, forming, as it does, the basis of instruction in Mohammedan schools. In his preface to the Gulistan, Saadi tells how he came to write the book. It happened once that I was benighted in a garden, in company with one of my friends. The spot was delightful, the trees intertwined. You would have said that the earth was bedecked with glass spangles, and that the knot of the Pleiades was suspended from the branch of the vine. A garden with a running stream, and trees from whence birds were warbling melodious strains, that filled with tulips of various hues, these loaded with fruits of several kinds. Under the shade of its trees the zephyr had spread the variegated carpet. In the morning, when the desire to return home overcame our inclination for remaining, I saw in his lap a collection of roses, odoriferous herbs and hyacinths, which he had intended to carry to town. I said, You are not ignorant of the fact that the flower of the garden soon fadeth, and that the enjoyment of the rose bush is but of short continuance. And the sages have declared that the heart ought not to be set upon anything that is transitory. He asked, What course is then to be pursued? I replied, I am able to form a book of roses, which will delight the beholders, and gratify those who are present, whose leaves, the tyrannic arm of the autumnal blasts can never affect, nor injure the blossoms of its spring. 
What benefit will you derive from a basket of flowers? Carry a leaf from my garden. A rose may continue in bloom for five or six days, but this rose garden will flourish for ever. As soon as I had uttered these words, he flung the flowers from his lap, and, laying hold of the skirt of my garment, exclaimed, When the beneficent promise, they faithfully discharged their engagements. In the course of a few days, two chapters, one on the comforts of society, and the other containing rules for conversation, were written out in my notebook, in a style that may be useful to orators, and improve the skill of letter-writers. In short, whilst the rose was yet in bloom, the book, entitled The Rose Garden, was finished. The Bustan, Saadi's other famous work, is also used as a textbook in military and civic examinations, and consists of ten chapters of didactic verse. The remarkable fact about his writings is the extremely simple way in which they are expressed. He took his lessons from the world. Indeed, he went so far in his zeal to experience all things personally, that he, at one time, assumed the religion of the worshippers of Vishnu, a sect for which he really had no sympathy. The story of this assumed conversion is told in his Bustan. Saadi became a confirmed woman-hater, owing probably to his two unfortunate marriages. He himself has given us a graphic account of his first marriage in the Gulistan, as well as a most lovely lament on the death of his only son. His daughter lived to marry the famous Hafez. Taking his writings as a whole, one may say that Saadi's creed was cheerfulness and contentment. In fact, he himself tells us that he was never discontented but once in his life, when he grumbled because he had no shoes. But shortly after, he met a man who had no feet. His grumbling ceased. This dervish wit and linguist the Mohammedans worshipped as a saint, even attributing miracles to him. His body now lies entombed in the valley of Shiraz, and is daily visited by devout pilgrims who say of him, in true oriental fashion, that he perforated with the diamond of his soul the precious stones of his experiences, and after gathering them on the string of eloquence, hung them for a talisman round the neck of posterity. End of section 1「Section 2 of A Selection from the Poetry of Saadi Shirazi Edited by Nathan Haskell Dole and Bell Walker This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gulistan or Rose Garden Part 1 Preface The Glorious Qualities of the Monarch of the True Faith May God Make Clear Its Demonstration Abu Bakir bin Sa'd bin Zangi the fair report of Saadi, which is celebrated by the general voice, and the fame of his sayings, which has travelled the whole surface of the earth, and the loved reed, which imparts his discourse, and which they devour like honey, and the manner in which men carry off the scraps of his writing, as though they were gold leaf, are not to be ascribed to the perfection of his own excellence, or eloquence, but to this, that the Lord of the earth the axis of the revolution of time, the successor of Suleiman, the defender of the people of the true faith, the puissant king of kings, the great Atabak Muzaffar ad-Din Abu Bakir bin Sad bin Zangi, God's shadow on earth, O God, approve him and his desires, has regarded him with extreme condescension and bestowed on him lavish commendation and evinced a sincere regard for him. Of a verity, from attachment to him, all people, both high and low, have become favourably inclined toward me, since men adopt the sentiments of their kings. Quatrain Since to my lowliness thou didst with favour turn, my track is clearer than the sun's bright beam, though in thy servant all might every fault discern. When kings approve, e'en vices virtues seem. Verse T'was in the bath, a piece of perfumed clay came from my loved one's hands to mine one day. Art thou then musk or ambergris, I said, that by thy scent my soul is ravished. 
Not so it answered, worthless earth was I, but long I kept the roses company. Thus near its perfect fragrance to me came, else I'm but earth, the worthless and the same. Story A king was seated in a vessel with a Persian slave. The slave had never before beheld the sea, nor experienced the inconvenience of a ship. He began to weep and bemoan himself, and a tremor pervaded his frame. In spite of their endeavours to soothe him, he would not be quieted. The comfort of the king was disturbed by him, but they could not devise a remedy. In the ship there was a philosopher, who said, If you command, I will silence him. The king answered, It would be the greatest favour. The philosopher directed them to cast the slave into the sea. He underwent several submersions, and they then took him by the hair and dragged him toward the ship. He clung to the rudder of the vessel with both hands, and they then pulled him on board again. When he had come on board, he seated himself in a corner and kept quiet. The king approved and asked, What was the secret of this expedient? The philosopher replied, At first he had not tasted the agony of drowning, and knew not the value of the safety of a vessel. In the same manner, a person who is overtaken by calamity learns to value a state of freedom from ill. Stanza Sated thou wilt my barley loaf repel. She whom I love ill-favoured seems to thee. To Eden's houris iraf would seem hell. Hell's inmates ask, they call it heavenly. Couplet Wide is the space twixt him who clasps his love, and him whose eyes watch for the door to move. Story In a certain year I was engaged in devotion at the tomb of the prophet Yahya in the principal mosque of Damascus. It happened that one of the Arabian princes, who was notorious for his injustice, came as a pilgrim thither, performed his prayers, and asked of God what he stood in need of. Couplet The poor, the rich, alike must here adore. The wealthier they, their need is here the more. He then turned toward me and said, on account of the generous character of dervishes, and the sincerity of their dealings, I ask you to give me the aid of your spirit, for I stand in dread of a powerful enemy. I replied, Show mercy to thy weak subjects, that thou mayst not experience annoyance from a puissant foe. Verse With the strong arm and giant grasp, tis wrong to crush the feeble, unresisting throng. Who pities not the fallen, let him fear, lest, if he fall, no friendly hand be near. Who sows ill actions, and of blessing dreams, fosters vain fantasies, and idly schemes. Unstop thy ears, thy people's wants relieve. If not, a day shall come when all their rights receive. Distichs All Adam's race are members of one frame, since all, at first, from the same essence came, when by hard fortune one limb is oppressed, the other members lose their wonted rest. If thou feel'st not for others' misery, a son of Adam is no name for thee. Story One of my companions came to me with complaints of his ill fortune, saying, I have but little means of subsistence, and a large family, and I cannot support the burden of poverty. It has frequently entered my head that I would go to another country, in order that, live how I may, no one may know of my welfare or the reverse. Couplet Full many a starving white has slept unknown, for many a spirit fled that none bemoan. Again I am in dread of the rejoicing of my enemies, lest they laugh scoffingly at me behind my back and impute my exertions in behalf of my family to a want of humanity, and say, Stanza, See now, that wretch devoid of shame, for him fair fortune's face will smile not, nor has smiled. Himself he pampers in each selfish whim, and leaves his hardship to his wife and child. And I know something, as you are aware, of the science of accounts, if by your interest, a means of subsistence could be afforded me, which might put me at ease, 
I should not be able to express my gratitude sufficiently to the end of my life. I replied, Oh, my friend, the king's service has two sides to it, hope of a livelihood and terror for one's life, and it is contrary to the opinion of the wise through such a hope to expose oneself to such a fear. Stanza None in the poor man's hut demand tax on his garden or his land. Be thou content with toil and woe, or with thy entrails feed the crow. He replied, These words that thou hast spoken do not apply to my case, nor hast thou returned an answer to my question. Hast thou not heard what they have said, that the hand of every one who chooses to act dishonestly trembles in rendering the account? Couplet God favours those who follow the right way. From a straight road I ne'er saw mortal stray. And the sages have said, Four kinds of persons are in deadly fear of four others. The brigand of the sultan, and the thief of the watchman, and the adulterer of the informer, and the harlot of the superintendent of police. And what fear have those of the settling whose accounts are clear? Stanza Wouldst thou confine thy rival's power to harm thee at discharge? Then while thy trust remains, be not too free. None shall thee then alarm. Tis the soiled raiment which, to cleanse from stains, is struck on stones, and asks the washer's pains. I answered, Applicable to thy case is the story of that fox which people saw running away in violent trepidation. Someone said to him, what calamity has happened to cause thee so much alarm? He replied, I have heard that they are going to impress the camel. They rejoined, O oh, shattered brain, what connection has a camel with thee, and what resemblance hast thou to it? He answered, Peace, for if the envious should, to serve their own ends, say, This is a camel, and I should be taken, who would care about my release so as to inquire into my condition? and before the antidote is brought from Iraq, the person who is bitten by the snake may be dead, and in the same way thou possessest merit, and good faith, and piety, and uprightness. But the envious are in ambush, and the accusers are lurking in corners. If they should misrepresent thy fair qualities, and thou shouldst incur the king's displeasure, and fall into disgrace, who would have power, in that situation of affairs, to speak for thee. I look upon it as thy best course to secure the kingdom of contentment, and to abandon the idea of preferment, since the wise have said, Couplet Upon the sea, tis true, is boundless gain, which thou be safe, upon the shore remain. When my friend heard these words, he was displeased, and his countenance was overcast and he began to utter words which bore marks of his vexation, saying, What judgment and profit and understanding and knowledge is this? And the saying of the sages has turned out correct, in that they have said, Those are useful friends who continue so when we are in prison, for at our table all our enemies appear friends. Stanza Think not thy friend, one who in fortune's hour boasts of his friendship and fraternity, him I call friend, who sums up all his power to aid thee in distress and misery. I saw that he was troubled, and that my advice was taken in bad part. I went to the President of Finance, and, in accordance with our former intimacy, I told him the case, in consequence of which he appointed my friend to some trifling office. Some time passed away. They saw the amenity of his disposition, and approved his excellent judgment. His affairs prospered, and he was appointed to a superior post, and, in the same manner, the star of his prosperity continued to ascend, until he reached the summit of his desires, and became a confidential servant of His Majesty the Sultan, and the pointed at by men's fingers, and one in whom the ministers of state placed their confidence. I rejoiced at his secure position, and said, Couplet Have no doubts, because of trouble, nor be thou discomforted, for the water of life's fountain springeth from a gloomy bed. Couplet Ah, ye brothers of misfortune, be not ye with grief oppressed. Many are the secret virtues 
which with the all bounteous rest. Couplet Sit not sad, because that time a fitful aspect weareth. Patience is most bitter, yet most sweet the fruit it beareth. During this interval I happened to accompany a number of my friends on a journey to Hijaz. When I returned from the pilgrimage to Mecca, he came out two stages to meet me. I saw his outward appearance was one of distress, and that he wore the garb of a dervish. I said, What is thy condition? He replied, Just as thou saidst. A party became envious of me, and accused me of disloyal conduct and the king did not deign to inquire minutely into the explanation of the circumstances. And my former companions, and even my sincere friends, forbore to utter the truth, and forgot their long intimacy. Stanza When one has fallen from high heaven's decree, the banded world will trample on his head. Then fawn and fold their hands respectfully, when they behold his steps by fortune led. In short, I was subjected to all kinds of tortures, till within this week that the good tidings of the safety of the pilgrims arrived, when they granted me release from grievous durance with the confiscation of my hereditary estate. I said, At that time thou wouldst not receive my suggestion, that the service of the king is like a sea voyage, at once profitable and fraught with peril, where thou either wilt acquire a treasure, or perish amid the billows. Couplet or with both hands the merchant shall one day embrace the gold, or by the waves his lifeless form shall on the strand be rolled. I did not think it right to lacerate his mental wounds further, or to sprinkle them with salt. I confined myself to these two couplets, and said, Stanza Knewest thou not that thou wouldst see the chains upon thy feet, when a deaf ear thou turnest on the counsels of the wise? If the torture of the sting thou canst not with courage meet, place not thy finger in the hole where the sullen scorpion lies. Story A person had reached perfection in the art of wrestling. He knew three hundred and sixty precious slights in this art, and every day he wrestled with a different device. However, his heart was inclined toward the beauty of one of his pupils. He taught him three hundred and fifty-nine throws, all he knew save one, the teaching of which he deferred. The youth was perfect in skill and strength, and no one could withstand him, till he at length boasted before the sultan that he allowed the superiority of his master over him only out of respect to his years, and what was due to him as an instructor, and that, but for that, he was not inferior in strength, and on a par with him in skill. The king was displeased at his breach of respect, and he commanded them to wrestle. A vast arena was selected. The great nobles and ministers of the king attended. The youth entered like a furious elephant, with a shock that had his adversary been a mountain of iron would have uptorn it from its base. The master perceived that the young man was his superior in strength. He fastened on him with that curious grip which he had kept concealed from him. The youth knew not how to foil it. The preceptor lifted him with both hands from the ground and raised him above his head, and dashed him on the ground. A shout of applause arose from the multitude. The king commanded them to bestow a robe of honour and reward on the master, and heaped reproaches on the youth, saying, Thou hast presumed to encounter him who educated thee, and thou hast failed. He replied, Sire, my master overcame me not by strength or power, but a small point was left in the art of wrestling which he withheld from me, and by this trifle he has to-day gotten the victory over me. The preceptor said, I reserved it for such a day as this. For the sages have said, Give not thy friend so much power, that if one day he should become a foe, thou mayst not be able to resist him. Hast thou not heard what once was said by one who had suffered wrong from a pupil of his own? Stanza. On earth there is no gratitude, I trow, or none, perhaps, to use it now pretend. None learn of me the science of the bow, who make me not their target in the end. Story. The king gave an order to put an innocent person to death. He said, 
O king, for the anger which thou feelest against me, seek not thine own injury. The king asked, How so? He replied, I shall suffer this pang but for a moment, and the guilt of it will attach to thee for ever. Quatrain Circling on, life's years have fled, as flies the breeze of morn. Sadness and mirth, and foul and fair, for I have passed away. Dreamst thou, tyrant? Thou hast wreaked on me thy rage and scorn. The burden from my neck has passed, on thine must ever stay. The king laughed and said, In thy life thou never saidst a truer word than this. He then commanded the usual allowance for descendants of the prophet to be got ready for him. STORY Abdul Qadir Gilani laid his face on the pebbles in the sanctuary of the Kaaba, and said, O Lord, pardon me, but if I am deserving of punishment, raise me up at the resurrection blind, that I may not be ashamed in the sight of the righteous. STANZA Humbly in dust I bow each day my face, with wakening memory. O thou, whom I forget not, say, dost thou bethink thee heir of me? STORY A thief entered the house of a recluse. However much he searched, he found nothing. He turned back sadly and in despair, and was observed by the holy man, who cast the blanket on which he slept in the way of the thief, that he might not be disappointed. STANZA The men of God's true faith, I have heard, grieve not the hearts e'en of their foes. When will this station be conferred on thee who dost thy friends oppose? The friendship of the pure-minded, whether in presence or absence, is not such that they will find fault with thee behind thy back, and die for thee in thy presence. Couplet Before thee, like the lamb they gentle are, absent, than savage wolves more ruthless far. Couplet They who the faults of others bring to you, be sure they'll bear to others your faults too. Story Certain travellers had agreed to journey together, and to share their pains and pleasures. I wished to join them. They withheld their consent. I said, It is inconsistent with the benevolent habits of the eminent to avert the countenance from the society of the lowly, and to decline to be of service to them. And I feel in myself such power of exertion and energy that, in the service of men, I should be an active friend not a weight on their minds. Couplet What, though I am born not in the camel throng, yet will I strive to bear your loads along. One of them said, Let not thy heart be grieved at the answer thou hast received, for within the last few days a thief came in the guise of a dervish, and linked himself in the chain of our society. Couplet What know men of the wearer, though they know the dress full well. The letter-writer only can the letter's purport tell. Inasmuch as the state of dervishes is one of security, they had no suspicion of his meddling propensities, and admitted him into companionship. Distics Rags are the external sign of holiness, sufficient for men judged by outward dress. Strive to do well, and what thou pleasest, wear. Thy head a crown, thine arm a flag may bear. Virtue lies not in sackcloth, coarse and sad. Be purely pious, and in satin clad. True holiness consists in quitting vice, the world and lust, not dress. Let this suffice. Let valiant men their breasts with iron plate. Weapons of war ill suit the effeminate. In short, one day we had journeyed till dusk, and slept for the night under a castle's walls. The graceless thief took up the water-pot of one of his comrades, saying that he was going for a necessary purpose, and went, in truth, to plunder. Couplet He'd fain with tattered garment for a dervish pass, and makes the Kaaba's pall the housings of an ass. As soon as he had got out of the sight of the dervishes, he scaled a bastion, and stole a casket. Before the day dawned, that dark-hearted one had got to a considerable distance, 
and his innocent companions were still asleep. In the morning they carried them all to the fortress and imprisoned them. From that day we have abjured society and kept to the path of retirement, for in solitude there is safety. Stanza When but one member of a tribe has done a foolish act, all bear alike disgrace. Seest thou how in the mead one ox alone will lead astray the whole herd of a place? I said, I thank God, may he be honoured and glorified, that I have not remained excluded from the beneficial influences of the dervishes, although I have been deprived of their society, and I have derived profit from this story, and this advice will be useful to such as I am through the whole of life. Distichs be there but one rough person in their train, For his misdeeds the wise will suffer pain. Should you assist him with rosewater fill, A dog dropped in it would defile it still. Story A religious recluse became the guest of a king. When they sat down to their meals, He ate less than his wont, And when they rose up to pray, He prayed longer than he was accustomed to, That they might have a greater opinion of his piety. Couplet. O Arab, much I fear thou at Mecca's shrine wilt never be, for the road thou art going is the road to Tartary. When he returned to his own abode, he ordered the cloth to be laid that they might eat. He had a son possessed of a ready wit, who said, O oh, my father, didst thou eat nothing at the entertainment of the Sultan? He replied, I ate nothing in their sight to serve a purpose. The son rejoined, Repeat thy prayers again, and make up for their omission, since thou hast done nothing that can serve any purpose. Stanza Thy merits in thy palm thou dost display, Thy faults beneath thy arm from sight withhold. What wilt thou purchase, vain one, In that day, the day of anguish, With thy feigned gold? Story I remember that in the time of my childhood I was devout and in the habit of keeping vigils, and eager to practice mortification and austerities. One night I sat up in attendance on my father, and did not close my eyes the whole night, and held the precious cordon in my lap while the people around me slept. I said to my father, Not one of these lifts up his head to perform a prayer. They are so profoundly asleep that you would say they were dead. He replied, Life of thy father, it were better if thou too were to sleep, rather than thou shouldst be backbiting people. Stanza Nought but themselves can vain pretenders mark, for conceit's curtain intercepts their view. Did God illume that which in them is dark, nought than themselves would wear a darker hue. Story in a certain assembly they were extolling a person of eminence and going to an extreme in praising his excellent qualities. He raised his head and said, I am that which I know myself to be. Couplet Thou who wouldst sum my virtues up, enough thou find in outward semblance, to my secret failings blind. Stanza my person, in men's eyes, is fair to view, but for my inward faults shame bows my head. The peacock, lauded for his brilliant hue, is by his ugly feet discomforted. Story They asked Lukman, of whom didst thou learn manners? He replied, from the unmannerly. Whatever I saw them do, which I disapproved of, that I abstained from doing. Stanza. Not e'en in jest a playful word is said, but to the wise twill prove a fruitful theme. To fools a hundred chapters may be read of grave import. To them they'll jesting seem. Story. They asked one of the sheikhs of Damascus, What is the true state of Sufism? He replied, Formerly they were a sect outwardly disturbed, but inwardly collected and at this day they are a tribe outwardly collected and inwardly disturbed. Stanza While ever rose from place to place thy heart, 
no peacefulness in solitude thou'lt see. Hast thou estates, wealth, rank, the trader's mart? Be thy heart God's, this solitude may be. End of part one of Gulistan or Rose Garden Section three of Selection from the Poetry of Sadi Shirazi Edited by Nathan Haskell Dole and Bell Walker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gulistan or Rose Garden Part two Story A king had reached the close of his life and had no heir to succeed him. He made a will that they should place the royal crown on the head of the first person who might enter the gates of the city in the morning, and should confide the government to him. It happened that the first person who entered the city gate was a beggar, who throughout his whole life had collected scrap after scrap, and sown rag upon rag. The pillars of the state, and ministers of the late king, executed his will, and bestowed on him the country and the treasure. The dervish carried on the government for a time, when some of the great nobles turned their necks from obeying him, and the princes of the surrounding countries rose up on every side to oppose him, and arrayed their armies against him. In short, his troops and his subjects were thrown into confusion, and a portion of his territory departed from his possession. The dervish was in a state of dejection at this circumstance, when one of his old friends, who was intimate with him in the time of his poverty, returned from a journey and finding him in this exalted position, said, Thanks be to God, may he be honoured and glorified, that thy lofty destiny has aided thee, and thy auspicious fortune has led thee on, so that thy rose has come forth from the thorn, and the thorn from thy foot, and thou hast arrived at this rank. Surely with calamity comes rejoicing. Couplet The bud now blossoms, withered now is found. The tree now naked, now with leaves is crowned. He replied, O oh brother, condole with me, for there is no room for felicitation. When thou sawest me, I was distressed for bread, and now I have the troubles of a world upon me. Distichs Have we no worldly gear? Tis grief and pain. Have we it? Then its charms our feet enchain. Can we than this a plague more troublous find, which absent, present, still afflicts the mind? Stanza Wouldst thou be rich, seek but content to gain, for this a treasure is that ne'er will harm. If in thy lap some dives riches reign, let not thy heart with gratitude grow warm, for, by the wisest, I have oft been told, the poor man's patience better is than gold. Couplet A locust's leg, the poor ant's gift, is more than the wild ass dressed whole from Bahram's store. Footnote Bahram, the sixth of that name, was a king of Persia called Gore, from his fondness for hunting the wild ass. This couplet is a sort of oriental version of the widow's might. End footnote Story Having become weary of the society of my friends at Damascus, I set out for the wilderness of Jerusalem, and associated with the brutes, until I was made prisoner by the Franks, who set me to work, along with Jews, at digging in the fosse of Tripolis, till one of the principal men of Aleppo, between whom and myself a former intimacy had subsisted, passed that way and recognised me, and said, What state is this? And how are you living? I replied, Stanza. From men to mountain, and to wild I fled, Myself to heavenly converse to betake. Conjecture now my state, That in a shed of savages I must my dwelling make. Couplet. Better to live in chains with those we love, Than with the strange bid flowerets gay to move. He took compassion on my state, And with ten dinars redeemed me from the bondage of the Franks, and took me along with him to Aleppo. He had a daughter, whom he united to me in the marriage knot, with a portion of a hundred dinars. 
As time went on, the girl turned out of a bad temper, quarrelsome and unruly. She began to give a loose to her tongue, and to disturb my happiness, as they have said. Distics. In a good man's house an evil wife is his hell above in this present life. From a vixen wife protect us well, save us, O God, from the pains of hell. At length she gave vent to reproaches, and said, Art thou not he whom my father purchased from the Franks' prison for ten dinars? I replied, Yes, he redeemed me with ten dinars, and sold me into thy hands for a hundred. Distics I have heard that once a man of high degree from a wolf's teeth and claws a lamb set free. That night its throat he severed with a knife, when thus complained the lamb's departing life. Thou from the wolf didst save me then, but now, too plainly I perceive, the wolf art thou. Story One of the Syrian recluses had for years worshipped in the desert, and sustained life by feeding on the leaves of trees. The king of that region made a pilgrimage to visit him, and said, If thou thinkest fit, I will prepare a place for thee in the city that thou mayest have greater conveniences for devotion than here and that others may be benefited by the blessing of thy prayers, and may imitate thy virtuous acts. The devotee did not assent to these words. The noble said, To oblige the king, the proper course is for thee to come into the city for a few days, and learn the nature of the place. After which, if the serenity of thy precious time suffers disturbance from the society of others, thou wilt be still free to choose. They relate that the devotee entered the city, and that they prepared for him the garden of the king's own palace, a place delightsome to the mind, and suited to tranquillise the spirit. Distics Like beauty's cheek, bright shone its roses red, its hyacinths, like fair one's ringlets spread, seemed babes which from their mother's milk ne'er drew, in winter's cold so shrinkingly they grew couplet and the branches on them grew pomegranate flowers like fire suspended there mid verdant bowers the king forthwith dispatched a beautiful damsel to him verse a young moon that e'en saints might lead astray angel in form a peacock in display when once beheld not hermits could retain their holy state nor undisturbed remain in like manner, after her, the king sent a slave, a youth of rare beauty, and of graceful proportions. Stanza. Round him, who seems cup-bearer, people sink. Of thirst they die, he gives them not to drink. The eyes that see him, still unsated crave, as dropsy thirsts amid the Euphrates wave. The holy man began to feed on dainties, and wear soft raiment and to find gratification and enjoyment in fruits and perfumes, as well as to survey the beauty of the youth and of the damsel. And the wise have said, The ringlets of the beautiful are the fetters of reason, and a snare to the bird of intelligence. Couplet In thy behoof, my heart, my faith, my intellect, I vow. In truth, a subtle bird am I, the snare this day art thou. In short, the bliss of his tranquil state began to decline, as they have said. Stanza All that exist, disciples, doctors, saints, the pure and eloquent alike, all fail when once this world's base gear their minds attaints, as flies their legs in honey vainly trail. At length the king felt a desire to visit him. He found the recluse altered in appearance from what he was before, with a florid complexion, and waxen fat, pillowed on a cushion of brocade, and the fairy-faced slave standing at his head, with a fan of peacock's feathers. The monarch was pleased at his felicitous state, and the conversation turned on a variety of subjects, till, at the close of it, the king said, Of all the people in the world, I value these two sorts most the learned and the devout. A philosophical and experienced vizier was present. He said, O king, 
friendship requires that thou shouldst do good to both these two orders of men to the wise give gold that they may study the more and to the devout give nothing that they may remain devout couplet to the devout nor pence nor gold divide if one receive it seek another guide stanza kind manners and a heart on god bestowed make up the saint without alms begged or bread that piety bequeaths what though no load of turquoise rings on beauty's fingers shed their ray nor from her ear the shimmering gem depends tis beauty still and needs not them stanza o gentle dervish blessed with mind serene thou hast no need of arms or hermit's fare lady of beauteous face and graceful mien thou well the turquoise ring and gourds canst spare couplet seek i for goods which not to me belong then if men call me worldly they're not wrong story in conformity with the preceding story an affair of importance occurred to the king he said if the termination of this matter be in accordance with my wishes i will distribute so many dear arms to holy men when his desire was accomplished it became incumbent on him to fulfil his vow according to the conditions he gave a bag of dear arms to one of his favourite servants and told him to distribute them among devout personages they say that the servant was shrewd and intelligent he went about the whole day and returned at night and kissing the dear arms laid them before the king saying however much i searched for the holy men i could not find them the king replied what tale is this i know that in this city there are four hundred saints he answered o lord of the earth the devout accept them not and he who accepts them is not devout the king laughed and said to his courtiers strong as my good intentions are toward this body of godly men and much as i wish to express my favour toward them i am thwarted by proportionate enmity and rejection of them on the part of this saucy fellow and he has reason on his side couplet when holy men accept of coin from thee leave them and seek some better devotee story they asked a profoundly learned man his opinion as to pious bequests he said if the allowance is received in order to tranquillize the mind and obtain more leisure for devotion it is lawful but when people congregate for the sake of the endowment it is unlawful couplet for sacred leisure saints receive their bread not to gain food that ease is furnished story a disciple said to his spiritual guide what shall i do for i am harassed by people through the frequency of their visits to me and my precious moments are disturbed by their coming and going he replied lend to all who are poor and demand a loan of all who are rich and they will not come about thee again couplet if islam's van a beggar should precede to china infidels would fly his greed story a band of dissolute fellows came to find fault with a dervish and used unwarrantable language and wounded his feelings he carried his complaint before the chief of his order and said i have undergone such and such his chief replied o son the patched robe of the dervishes is the garment of resignation every one who in this garb endures not disappointment patiently is a pretender and it is unlawful for him to wear the robe of the dervish couplet a stone makes not great rivers turbid grow when saints are vexed their shallowness they show stanza hast thou been injured suffer it and clear thyself from guilt in pardoning others sin o brother since the end of all things here is into dust to moulder be thou in like humble mould ere yet the change begin story in verse list to my tale in baghdad once dispute between a flag and curtain rose its suit the banner dusty and with toil oppressed urged and the curtain angry thus addressed myself and thou were comrades at one school 
both now are slaves neath the same monarch's rule i in his service ne'er have rested still whate'er the time i journey at his will my foot is ever foremost in emprise then why hast thou more honour in men's eyes with moon-faced slaves thy moments pass away with jasmine-scented girls thou mak'st thy stay i lie neglected still in servile hands tossed by the winds my head my feet in bands the threshold is my couch the curtain said and ne'er like thee to heaven raise i my head he who exalts his neck with vain conceit hurls himself headlong from his boasted seat story a pious man saw an athlete who was exasperated and infuriated foaming at the mouth he said what is the matter with this man someone answered such a one has abused him what said the holy man this contemptible fellow can lift a stone of a thousand man's weight yet has not the power to support a word stanza boast not thy strength or manhood while thy heart is swayed by impulse base if man thou art or woman matters naught but rather aim or mouths to sweeten thus deserve the name of man for manliness doth not consist in stopping others voices with thy fist stanza though one could brain an elephant yet he is not a man without humanity in earth the source of adam's sons began art thou not humble then thou art not man story a king was regarding a company of dervishes contemptuously one of them acute enough to divine his feelings said o king we in this world are inferior to thee in military pomp but enjoy more pleasure and are equal with thee in death and superior to thee in the day of resurrection distichs the conqueror may in every wish succeed of bread the dervish daily stands in need but in that hour when both return to clay naught but their winding sheet they take away when man makes up his load this realm to leave the beggar finds less cause than kings to grieve the outward mark of a dervish is a patched garment and shaven head but his essential qualities are a living heart and mortified passions stanza not at strife's door sits he when thwarted ne'er starts up to contest all unmoved his soul he is no saint who from the path would stir though a huge stone should from a mountain roll the dervish's course of life is spent in commemorating and thanking and serving and obeying god and in beneficence and contentment and in the acknowledgment of one god and in reliance on him and in resignation and patience everyone who is endued with these qualities is in fact a dervish though dressed in a tunic but a babbler who neglects prayer and is given to sensuality and the gratification of his appetite who spends his days till nightfall in the pursuit of licentiousness and passes his night till day returns in careless slumber eats whatever is set before him and says whatever comes uppermost is a profligate though he wear the habit of a dervish stanza o thou whose outer robe is falsehood pride while inwardly thou art to virtue dead thy curtain of seven colours put aside while the inner house with mats is poorly spread footnote it is customary in persia to have a curtain at the portal of the house the richness of which depends on the circumstances of the owner End footnote. story in verse i saw some handfuls of the rose in bloom with bands of grass suspended from a dome i said what means this worthless grass that it should in the rose's fairy circle sit then wept the grass and said be still and know the kind their old associates ne'er forego mine is no beauty hue or fragrance true but in the garden of the lord i grew his ancient servant i reared by his bounty from the dust whate'er my quality i'll in his favouring mercy trust no stock of worth is mine nor fund of worship yet he will a means of help divine 
when aid is past, he'll save me still. Those who have power to free, let their old slaves in freedom live, thou glorious majesty. Me, too, thy ancient slave, forgive. Sadi, move thou to resignation's shrine. O man of God, the path of God be thine. Hapless is he who from this haven turns, all doors shall spurn him who this portal spurns. Story I never complained of the vicissitudes of fortune, nor suffered my face to be overcast at the revolution of the heavens, except once, when my feet were bare, and I had not the means of obtaining shoes. I came to the chief mosque of Kufa in a state of much dejection and saw there a man who had no feet. I returned thanks to God, and acknowledged his mercies, and endured my want of shoes with patience, and exclaimed, Stanza, Roast fowl to him that sated will seem less upon the board than leaves of garden cress, while in the sight of helpless poverty boiled turnip will a roasted pullet be. Story A merchant met with the loss of a thousand dinars, and said to his son, Thou must not tell any one of this matter. The son replied, O oh, father, it is thy command. I will not tell. Acquaint me, however, with the advantage to be derived from keeping the affair secret. The father answered, In order that we may not have two misfortunes to encounter, first, the loss of our money, and secondly, the malignant rejoicings of our neighbours. Couplet do not to foes thy sufferings impart, lest, while they seem to grieve, they joy at heart. Story An intelligent young man, who possessed an ample stock of admirable accomplishments and a rare intellect, notwithstanding, uttered not a word whenever he was seated in the company of the wise. At length his father said, O son, why dost not thou also say something of what thou knowest? He replied, I fear lest they should ask me something of which I am ignorant, and I should bring on myself disgrace. Stanza One day a Sufi, hast thou heard it told, by chance was hammering nails into his shoe. Then of his sleeve an officer caught hold, and said, Come thou, and shoe my charger too. Couplet Art silent? None can meddle with thee. When thou once hast spoken, thou must prove it then. Story A man with a harsh voice was reading the Koran in a loud tone. A sage passed by and asked, What is thy monthly stipend? He replied, Nothing. Wherefore then, asked the sage, dost thou give thyself this trouble? He replied, I read for the sake of God. Then, said the sage, for God's sake, read not. Couplet If in this fashion the Koran you read, you'll mar the loveliness of Islam's creed. Story They asked Hassan Mayamandi, How is it that, although Sultan Mahmud has so many handsome slaves, every one of whom is the wonder of the world, and the marvel of the age, he has not such a regard or affection for any one as for Ayaz, who is not remarkable for beauty. He replied, Whatever pleases the heart appears fair to the eye. Distics The man for whom the Sultan shows esteem, though bad in every act, will virtuous seem. But whom the monarch pleases to reject, none of his retinue will e'er affect. Stanza when with antipathy we eye a man, we see in Joseph's beauty want of grace, and, prepossessed, should we a demon scan, he'd seem a cherub with an angel's face. Story They shut up a parrot in a cage with a crow. The parrot was distressed at the ugly appearance of the other, and said, What hateful form is this, and detested shape, and accursed face and unpolished manners? O oh, crow of the desert, would that between me and thee were the space twixt east and west. Stanza Should one at dawn arising thy face see, t'would change to twilight gloom that morning's mirth, such wretch as thou art should thy comrade be, 
but where could such a one be found on earth? But still more strangely, the crow, too, was harassed to death by the society of the parrot, and was utterly chagrined by it, reciting the deprecatory formula, There is no power nor strength but in God. It complained of its fate, and rubbing one upon the other the hands of vexation, it said, What evil fate is this, and unlucky destiny, and fickleness of fortune? It would have been commensurate with my deserts to have walked proudly along with another crow on the wall of a garden. Couplet Twill for a prison to the good suffice to herd them with the worthless sons of vice. What crime have I committed in punishment for which my fate has involved me in such a calamity, and imprisoned me with a conceited fool like this, at once worthless and fatuous? Stanza or would that war with loathing fly which bore impressed thy effigy, and if thy lot in Eden fell, all others would make choice of hell. I have brought this example to show that how strong soever the disgust a wise man may feel for a fool, a fool regards with a hundred times more aversion a wise man. Couplet A pious man, mid dance and song, was seated with the gay, one of Bork's beauty saw him there, and marked the mirth decay. Do we then weary thee, he said, at least uncloud thy brow, for we too feel thy presence here is bitterness enow. Quatrain This social band like roses is, and lilies joined in one, and mid them thou, a withered stick, up springest all alone. Like winter's cruel cold art thou, or like an adverse blast, thou sittest there like fallen snow, ice-bound and frozen fast. Story A man had a beautiful wife, who died, and his wife's mother, a decrepit old woman, on account of the marriage settlement, took up her abode and fixed herself in his house. The man was vexed to death by her propinquity, yet he did not see how to get rid of her by reason of the settlement. Some of his friends came to inquire after him, and one of them said, How dost thou bear the loss of thy beloved one? He replied, The not seeing my wife is not so intolerable to me as the seeing her mother. Footnote As he could not pay what he had covenanted to pay when he married, his wife's relations indemnified themselves by saddling him with the old lady, his wife's mother. End footnote Distichs. The tree has lost its roses, but retains its thorn. The treasure's gone, the snake remains. Tis better on the lance point fixed to see one's eye than to behold an enemy. Tis well a thousand friendships to erase could we thereby avoid our foeman's face. Footnote. It is a popular oriental notion that treasures are guarded by serpents. End footnote. Story. I remember that in my youth I was passing along a street when I beheld a moon-faced beauty. The season was that of the month of July, when the fierce heat dried up the moisture of the mouth, and the scorching wind consumed the marrow of the bones. Through the weakness of human nature I was unable to support the power of the sun, and involuntarily took shelter under the shade of a wall, waiting to see if anyone would relieve me from the pain I suffered owing to the ardour of the sun's rays, and cool my flame with water. All of a sudden, from the dark portico of a house, I beheld a bright form appear, of such beauty, that the tongue of eloquence would fail in narrating her charms. She came forth as morn succeeding a dark night, or as the waters of life issuing from the gloom. She held in her hand a cup of snow-water, in which she had mixed sugar and the juice of the grape. I know not whether she had perfumed it with her own roses, or distilled into it some drops from the bloom of her countenance. In short, I took the cup from her fair hand, and drained its contents, and received new life. The thirst of my heart cannot be slaked with a drop of water, nor if I should drink rivers would it be lessened. Stanza most blessed that happy one, whose gaze intense 
rests on such face at each successive morn the drunk with wine at midnight may his sense regain but not till the last day shall dawn will love's intoxication reach its born story they told to one of the arabian kings the story of Laili and majnun and of the insanity which happened to him so that although possessed of high qualities and perfect eloquence he betook himself to the desert and abandoned the reins of choice after commanding them to bring him into his presence the king began to rebuke him saying what defect hast thou seen in the nobleness of man's nature that thou hast taken up the habits of an animal and bidden adieu to the happiness of human society majnun wept and said verse often my friends reproached me for my love the day will come they'll see her and approve stanza would that those who seek to blame me could thy face o fairest see theirs would then the loss and shame be while amazed intent on thee they would wound their hands while they careless with the orange play that the truth of the reality might testify to the appearance i claim for her the king was inspired with a desire to behold her beauty in order to know what sort of person it was who was the cause of such mischief he commanded and they sought for her and searching through the arab families found her and brought her before the king in the court of the royal pavilion the king surveyed her countenance and beheld a person of a dark complexion and weak form she appeared to him so contemptible that he thought the meanest of the servants of his harem superior to her in beauty and grace majnun acutely discerned his thoughts and said o king it is requisite to survey the beauty of Laili from the window of the eye of majnun in order that the mystery of the spectacle may be revealed to you distichs unmoved with pity thou me hearest complain i need a comrade who can share my pain the live long day i'd then my woes recite wood with wood joined will ever burn more bright verse what passed within the hearing of the grove o forest leaves did ye but learn ye'd mourn with me my friends tell him whom love has spared i would he did but burn with lovers flames he'd then my grief discern verse scars may be laughed at by the sound but to a fellow sufferer reveal thy anguish of the hornet's wound what reck they who did never feel its sting till fortune shall bring round thy woes to thee they will but seem the weak illusions of a dream do not my sufferings confound with those of others canst thou deem one holding salt can tell the pain of him who has salt rubbed upon his wounded limb story in verse a gallant youth there was and fair pledged to a maid beyond compare they on the sea as poets tell together in a whirlpool fell the boatman came the youth to save to snatch him from his watery grave but mid those billows of despair he cried my love my love is there save her oh save he said and died but with his parting breath he cried not from that wretch love's story here who love forgets when perils near together thus these lovers died be told by him who love has tried for Sadi knows each whim and freak of love as well its ways can speak as baghdad's dwellers arabic hast thou a mistress her then prize and on all others close thine eyes could majnun and his laili back return they might love's story from this volume learn end of section three section four of a selection from the poetry of Sadi Shirazi, edited by Nathan Haskell Doll and Bell Walker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gulistan or Rose Garden, Part Three. Story: 
a king handed over his son to a teacher, and said, This is my son. Educate him as one of thine own sons. The preceptor spent some years in endeavouring to teach him without success, while his own sons were made perfect in learning and eloquence. The king took the preceptor to task, and said, Thou hast acted contrary to thy agreement, and hast not been faithful to thy promise. He replied, O king, education is the same, but capacities differ. Stanza Silver and gold, tis true in stones, are found, yet not all stones the precious metals bear. Canopus shines to earth's most distant bound, but here gives leather, scented leather there. Story I have heard of an old doctor who said to a pupil, if the minds of the children of men were as much fixed on the giver of subsistence as they are on the subsistence itself, they would rise above the angels. Stanza Thou wast by God then not forgotten when thou wast a seed, thy nature in suspense. He gave thee soul and reason, wisdom, ken, beauty and speech, reflection, judgment, sense. He on thy hand arrayed thy fingers ten, and thy arms fastened to thy shoulders. Whence canst thou then think, O thou, most weak of men, he'd be unmindful of thy subsistence? Story I saw the son of a rich man seated at the head of his father's sepulchre, and engaged in a dispute with the son of a poor man, and saying, My father's sarcophagus is of stone, and the inscription coloured with a pavement of alabaster and turquoise bricks. What resemblance has it to that of thy father, which consists of a brick or two huddled together, with a few handfuls of dust sprinkled over it? The son of the poor man heard him, and answered, Peace, for before thy father can have moved himself under this heavy stone, my sire will have arrived in paradise. This is the saying of the prophet, The death of the poor is repose. Couplet Doubtless the ass, on whom they do impose the lightest burden, also easiest goes. Stanza The poor man, who the agony has borne of famine's fangs, treads lightly to the door of death, while one from blessings torn, from luxury and ease, will grieve the more to lose them. This is certain. Happier he whom, like a captive, death from bonds sets free, than great men whom it hurries to captivity. Maxims on the Duties of Society Maxim Riches are for the sake of making life comfortable, not life for the sake of amassing riches. I asked a wise man, Who is fortunate, and who unfortunate? He replied, The fortunate is he who sowed and reaped, the unfortunate he who died and abandoned. Couplet. Not for that worthless one a prayer afford, who life in hoarding spent, ne'er spent his hoard. Maxim. Two men have laboured fruitlessly, and exerted themselves to no purpose. One is a man who has gained wealth without enjoying it. The other, he, who has acquired knowledge, but has failed to practice it. Distichs. How much soe'er thou learn'st, tis all vain. Who practised not, still ignorant remain. A quadruped, with volumes laden, Is no whit the wiser, or more sage for this. How can the witless animal discern If books be piled on it, or wood, to burn? Maxim. Science is for the cultivation of religion, Not for worldly enjoyments. Couplet. Who makes a gain of virtue, science, law, is one who garners up, then burns his store. Maxim. Three things lack permanency, uncombined with three other things. Wealth without trading, learning without instruction, and empire without a strict administration of justice. Stanza. By courteous speech, politeness, gentleness, sometimes thou mayest direct the human will. Anon by threats, for it oft profits less with sugar twice a hundred cups to fill than from one colocynth its bitters to distill. Maxim 
To show pity to the bad is to oppress the good, and to pardon oppressors is to tyrannize over the oppressed. Couplet When thou to base men givest encouragement, thou sharest their sins, since thou them aid hast lent. Maxim No reliance can be placed on the friendship of princes nor must we plume ourselves on the sweet voices of children, since that is changed by a caprice, and these by a single slumber. Couplet On the mistress of a thousand hearts do not thy love bestow, but, if thou wilt, prepare eftsoons her friendship to forego. Maxim Reveal not to a friend every secret that thou possessest. How knowest thou whether at some time he may not become an enemy? nor inflict on thy enemy every injury that is in thy power. Perchance he may some day become thy friend. Tell not the secret that thou wouldst have continue hidden to any person, though he may be worthy of confidence, for no one will be so careful of thy secret as thyself. Stanza Better be silent than thy purpose tell to others, and enjoin them secrecy. O dolt! Keep back the water at the well, for the swollen stream to stop thou'lt vainly try. In private, utter not a single word which thou in public wouldst regret were heard. Maxim. Let thy words between two foes be such, that if they were to become friends, thou wouldst not be ashamed. Distichs. Like fire is strife betwixt two enemies. The luckless mischief-maker wood supplies. Struck with confusion, and ashamed is he, If e'er the two belligerents agree. Can we in this aught rational discern, To light a fire which will ourselves first burn? Stanza In talk with friends, speak soft and low, Lest thy bloodthirsty foeman thee should hear. A wall may front thee, true, but dost thou know if there be not behind a listening ear? Maxim Whoever comes to an agreement with the enemies of his friends does so with the intention of injuring the latter. Couplet Eschew that friend, if thou art wise, who consorts with thy enemies. Maxim When, in transacting business, thou art in doubt, make choice of that side from which the least injury will result. Couplet. Reply not roughly to smooth language, nor contend with him who knocks at peace's door. Maxim. Anger that has no limit causes terror, and unseasonable kindness does away with respect. Be not so severe as to cause disgust, nor so lenient as to make people presume. Distichs. Sternness and gentleness are best combined. The leech both salves and scarifies, you find. The sage is not too rigorous, nor yet too mild, lest men their awe of him forget. He seeks not for himself to higher place, nor will himself to suddenly abase. Distichs Once to his sire a shepherd said, O sage, teach me one maxim worthy of thy age. Use gentleness, he said, yet not so much that the wolf be emboldened thee to clutch. Maxim Two persons are the foes of a state and a religion, a king without clemency and a religious man without learning. Couplet Ne'er to that king may state's allegiance own, who bows not humbly at the Almighty's throne. Maxim when an enemy has tried every expedient in vain, he will pretend friendship, and then, by this pretext, execute designs which no enemy could have effected. Maxim. When thou knowest tidings that will pain the heart of any one, be silent, so that another may be the first to convey them. Couplet. O nightingale, spring's tidings breathe, ill rumours to the owls bequeath. Maxim. Do not acquaint a king with the treason of any one, unless thou art assured that the disclosure will meet with his full approval, else thou art but labouring for thy own destruction. Couplet. Then, only then, to speak intend, 
when speaking can effect thy end. Maxim He who gives advice to a conceited man is himself in need of counsel. Maxim Be not caught by the artifice of a foe, nor purchase pride of a flatterer, for the one has set the snare of hypocrisy, and the other has opened the mouth of greediness. The fool is puffed up with flattery, like a corpse whose inflated heels appear plump. Stanza Heed not the flatterer's fulsome talk, he from thee hopes some trifle to obtain. Thou wilt, shouldst thou his wishes balk, two hundred times as much of censure gain. Maxim Unless someone points out to an orator his defects, his discourse will never be amended. Couplet to vaunt of one's own speaking is not meet, at fool's approval and one's own conceit. Maxim Everyone thinks his own judgment perfect, and his own son beautiful. Verse A Jew and Mussulman once so contended, that laughter seized me as their contest grew. The true believer thus his cause defended. Is this bond false? Then may I die a Jew. The Jew replied, by Moses' books I vow that tis true, or else a Mussulman am I. So from earth's face were wisdom's self to fly, not one could be amongst us found to allow that he judgment lacked, or himself stultify. Maxim. Whosoever does no good when he has the ability to do it, in the time of inability to aid others, will himself suffer distress. Couplet. Ill-starred indeed is he who injures men, is fortune adverse, he is friendless then. Maxim Affairs succeed by patience, and he that is hasty falleth headlong. Distics I've in the desert with these eyes beheld the hurrying pilgrims to the slow-stepped yield. The rapid courser in the rear remains, while the slow camel still its step maintains. Maxim. There is no better ornament for the ignorant than silence, and did he but know this, he would not be ignorant. Stanza. Hast thou not perfect excellence? Tis best to keep thy tongue in silence, for tis this which shames a man, as lightness does attest the nut is empty, nor of value is. Stanza. Once, in these words, a fool rebuked an ass. Go, thou who all thy life hast lived in vain. A sage said to him, Blockhead, why dost thou pass thy time in this? Jibes will be all thy gain. To learn of thee a brute no power has. Learn thou of brutes in silence to remain. Maxim. Whoso sits with bad men will not see aught good. Distics. With demons did an angel take his seat, he'd learn but terror, treason, and deceit. Thou from the bad wilt nothing learn but ill, the wolf will ne'er the farrier's office fill. Maxim. Divulge not the secret faults of men, for at the same time that thou disgracest them, thou wilt destroy thy own credit. Maxim. He that has acquired learning, and not practised what he has learned, is like a man who ploughs, but sows no seed. Maxim. Worship cannot be performed by the body without the mind, and a shell without a kernel will not do for merchandise. Maxim. Not every one who is ready at wrangling is correct in his dealings. Couplet. Forms are now beneath the mantle where the outward signs of grace but if thou shouldst them unwimple, thou wouldst find a grandam's face. Maxim. Not every one whose outward form is graceful possesses the graces of the mind, for action depends on the heart, not on the exterior. Stanza. From a man's qualities a day's enough to make us of his learning's limit sure. Plume not thyself as though the hidden stuff thou of his heart hast reached nor be secure, for not in long revolving years can tell the foul things which in man unnoticed dwell. Maxim. 
A weak man, who has the foolhardiness to contend with a strong one, assists his adversary in destroying himself. Stanza. He who is nursed in soft repose cannot with warriors to the battle go. Vain with his weakly arm to close and struggle with an iron-wristed foe. Maxim. Whoso will not listen to advice aims at hearing himself reproached. Couplet. He who will not to friends' advice attend must not complain when they him reprehend. Maxim. Persons devoid of virtue cannot endure the sight of the virtuous, just as market curs, when they see dogs of the chase, bark at them, but dare not approach them. Maxim. When a base fellow cannot vie with another in merit, he will attack him with malicious slander. Couplet. Weak envy, absent virtue slanders. Why? Since it is dumb perforce when it is by. Maxim. Wise men eat late. Devout men but half satisfy their appetites, and hermits take only enough to support life. The young eat till the dishes are removed, and the old till they sweat. But the calendars stuff till they have no room in their stomachs to breathe, and not a morsel is left on the table for any one. Couplet. The glutton for two nights no sleep can get, the first from surfeit, the next from regret. Maxim. Whoso slays not his enemy when he is in his power is his own enemy. Couplet. When a stone is in the hand, on a stone the serpent's pate, he is not a man of sense who to strike should hesitate. There are, however, persons who think the opposite of this advisable, and have said, It is better to pause in the execution of prisoners, inasmuch as the option of slaying or pardoning them is retained, whereas, if a prisoner be put to death without deliberation, it is probable that the best course will be let slip, since the step is irremediable. Couplets. Tis very easy one alive to slay, not so to give back life thou takest away. Reason demands that archers patience show, for shafts once shot return not to the bow. Maxim. The sage who engages in controversy with ignorant people must not expect to be treated with honour, and if a fool should overpower a philosopher by his loquacity, it is not to be wondered at, for a common stone will break a jewel. Couplet. What marvel is it if his spirits droop, a nightingale, and with him crows to coop? Couplets. What if a vagabond on merit rail? Let not the spirits of the worthy fail. A common stone may break a golden cup. Its value goes not down, the stone's not up. Maxim. It is not right to estrange in a moment a friend whom it takes a lifetime to secure. Triplet. Tis years before the pebble can put on the ruby's nature. Wilt thou on a stone in one short moment mar what time has done? Maxim. Purpose without power is mere weakness and deception, and power without purpose is fatuity and insanity. Couplet. Have judgment, counsel, sense, and then bear rule. Wealth, empire, are self-murder to the fool. The liberal man who enjoys and bestows is better than the devotee who fasts and lays by. Whoso abandons lust in order to gain acceptance with the world has fallen from venial desires into those which are unpardonable. Couplet. Hermits, who are not so, through piety, darken a glass and then attempt to see. Couplet. Little to little added much will grow, the barn store, grain by grain, is gathered so. Many littles make a mickle, many drops a flood. Maxim. It is not right for a learned man to pass over leniently the foolish impertinences of the vulgar, for this is detrimental to both parties. The awe which the former ought to inspire is diminished, and the folly of the latter augmented. Couplet. Art thou with fools too courteous, and too free, 
their pride and folly will augmented be. Maxim People forget the name of him whose bread they have not tasted during his lifetime. Joseph the Just, peace be on him, during the famine in Egypt, would not eat so as to satisfy his appetite that he might not forget the hungry. It is the poor widow that relishes the grapes, not the owner of the vineyard. Couplets He who in pleasure and abundance lives, what knows he of the pang that hunger gives? He can affliction best appreciate, who has himself experienced the same state. Stanza O thou, who rides a metal courser, see how toils mid mire the poor thorn-loaded ass. From poor men's houses let no fire for thee be brought. The wreaths which from their chimney pass are sighs wrung from their hearts by destiny. Maxim Two things are impossible, to obtain more food than what providence destines for us, and to die before the time known to God. Stanza Fate is not altered by a thousand sighs. Complain or render thanks, arrive it will. The angel at whose bidding winds arise cares little for the widow's lamp, if still it burns, or by the storm extinguished dies. Maxim the envious man begrudgeth God's blessings, and is the foe of the innocent. Stanza A wretched, crack-brained fellow once I saw, who slandered one of lofty dignity. I said, Good sir, I grant thee that a flaw may in thy fortunes be observed, but why impute it to the man who lives more happily? Second Stanza Oh, on the envious man invoke no curse, for of himself, poor wretch, accursed is he. On him no hatred can inflict aught worse than his self-fed, self-torturing enmity. Maxim A student without the inclination to learn is a lover without money, and a pilgrim without spirituality is a bird without wings, and a devotee without learning is a house without a door. End of Gulistan or Rose Garden. End of section four. Section five of a selection from the poetry of Saadi Shirazi, edited by Nathan Haskell Dole and Bell Walker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Selections from Bustan, or The Garden of Perfume The Moth and the Flame One night, I do remember, when mine eyes closed not, I heard a talking in this wise. Moth said to Lamp Flame, Ah, my well-beloved, I am a lover. This is no surprise if I do weep and burn. But thou, but thou, why do I see thee weeping, burning now? The lamp replied, Shirin Iman, soft lover, the honey of my life melts from my brow. It said, O oh, tearful lover, cease to sigh, passion's worst pangs thou knowest not, as I. Leave claiming, leave lamenting, or come boldly, nor power, nor patience of love's mystery hast thou, who fliest from my naked fire, desiring, yet afraid of thy desire. Hither and thither dost thou flutter, fearful, but I consume, exhale, glow, and expire. If flame of love thy silver feathers scorch, look upon me, who am love's kindled torch. Think on the blaze and torrent of my burning, forget my splendour, lightning court and porch. There lingered some little of the night, when one of party face put out that light. The smoke rose like a parting soul. It whispered, Look, lover, now indeed love endeth right. This is the road, Ra in Ast, learn of me, dying thou gainest love's best ecstasy. Make over lover slain no lamentation, cry, Shukur, thanks, he is accepted. He, O oh, if thou beest true lover, wash not hand from that dear stain of love, 
from worldly brand of wealth and self-love wash it at the last those win who spite of fortune's tempest stand glad to wreck all for love i say to thee i sadi launch not on that boundless sea but if thou puttest forth hoist sail quit anchor to storm and wave trust thyself hardily story of the pearl from a cloud there descended a droplet of rain twas ashamed when it saw the expanse of the main saying who may i be where the sea has its run if the sea has existence i truly have none since in its own eyes the drop humble appeared in its bosom a shell with its life the drop reared the sky brought the work with success to a close and the famed royal pearl from the raindrop arose because it was humble it excellence gained patiently waiting till success was obtained the death of sadi's son at sana a young child of mine melted away of all that occurred to me what shall i say a joseph-like picture the fates never gave but was jonah like gulped by the fish of the grave in this garden a cypress ne'er reached any height but the tempest of fate pulled its roots from their sight no wonder that roses will blow on the ground when beneath it so many rose bodies sleep sound to my heart i said die thou disgrace to mankind the child goes off pure the old man vile in mind out of love and distress for his stature alone from his tomb i extracted a panel of stone on account of my dread in that dark narrow place my disconsolate state changed the hue of my face when i came to myself from that horrible fear from my darling loved child this arrived at my ear if this region of darkness produced in you fright take care when you enter to carry a light if you wish that the night of the tomb should appear bright as day light the lamp of your actions while here shakes the husbandman's body from fever and care peradventure the palms should not luscious dates bear some covetous men the opinion maintain that without sowing wheat they'll a harvest obtain he who planted the root sardi on the fruit feeds he will gather the harvest who scattered the seeds patience and contentment in a generous man's spirit perfection is bred if no money he owns what's the harm or the dread were a miser with creases in riches to range do not think that his miserly spirit would change if a liberal person obtains not his bread his spirit is rich just as if he were fed the giving's the ground and the means the sown field bestow that the root fertile branches may yield i would wonder where god who makes man out of clay to make his humanity vanish away in holding up wealth do not strive to excel for water when stagnant emits a bad smell in munificence labour for water that flows by the favour of heaven to a mighty flood grows if a miser should fall from his wealth and estate very rarely again will his riches be great if you are a jewel of worth do not fret for time will not cause your existence to set a clod may be lying exposed on the way yet i do not see any one heed to it pay if a clipping of gold should escape from the shears with a candle they search for it till it appears from the heart of a stone they can crystal obtain where under the rust does a mirror remain the manners must please and exhibit much grace for coming and going are fortune and place the sufi and the slanderer said a man to a sufi with sanctity blessed you know not what some one behind you expressed he said silence o oh brother and sleep it away it is best not to know what your enemies say those people who carry the words of a foe than enemies truly more enmity show the remarks of a foe to a friend no one bears excepting the man who his enmity shares 
a foe cannot speak with such hardiness to me that from hearing my body should shivering be you are worse than a foe with your lips you unfold the same that your foe to you privately told a tale-bearer gives to old war a fresh life and urges a good gentle person to strife fly away from that comrade while strength in you lies who says unto sleeping sedition arise a man in a pit with his feet firmly bound is better than spreading disturbance around between two an encounter resembles a fire and the ill omen tell tales the fuel supplier sympathy for orphans a shade o'er the head of the orphan boy put disperse all his sighs and his sorrows uproot you know not why he has this helplessness seen does a tree without root ever show itself green when you see the sad head of an orphan bent low on the face of your son do not kisses bestow if an orphan should weep who will purchase relief and should he be vexed who will share in his grief take care lest he weeps for the great throne on high will tremble and shake should an orphan child cry by kindness the tears from his pure eyes displace by compassion disperse all the dust from his face if his own sheltering shadow has gone from his head take him under your own fostering shadow instead i at that time the head of a monarch possessed when i let it recline on my own father's breast if a fly on my body made bold to alight the hearts of a number were grieved at the sight if now to a dungeon they captive me bear not one of my friends to assist me would care the sufferings of poor orphan children i know in my childhood my father to god had to go dealing with enemies until your diplomacy terminates right it is better to flatter your foe than to fight when by force you are unable to vanquish your foes by favours the portal of strife you must close if you fear lest you be by an enemy stung with the charm of munificence tie up his tongue give your enemy money not thorns from a hedge for munificence blunts all the teeth that have edge by skill you can coax and enjoy earthly bliss the hand you can't bite it is proper to kiss by management rustem will come to the noose from whose coil asfandyar could not cast himself loose you can find the occasion your foe's skin to rend take care of him then as you would of a friend be cautious in fighting with one you despise from a drop i have oft seen a torrent arise while you can let not knots on your eyebrows be seen an opponent is best as a friend although mean his foe shows delight and his friend shows distress whose friends are in count than his enemies less with an army exceeding your own do not fight for you can't with your finger a lancet's point smite and should you be stronger in war than your foe to the weak tis unmanly oppression to show though you've lion-like hands and an elephant's force peace is better than war as a matter of course when the hand has by every deception been torn the hand to the sword may be lawfully borne should your foe wish for peace his request do not spurn and should he seek battle the reins do not turn for should he resolve to resist in the field the strength and the awe of a thousand you'll wield if his foot he has placed in the stirrup of war you won't be arraigned at the great judgment bar be prepared to for war should sedition awake for kindness to blackguards is quite a mistake if you talk in an affable way to a wretch his presumption and arrogance higher will stretch when your enemy vanquished approaches your gate cast revenge from your heart and cast ire from your pate you should kindness bestow when he asks for your care be gracious and of his deceptions beware from an aged man's counselling turn not away for he knows his work well who has lived to be grey and should they remove from its sight the stronghold the youth with the sword and with wisdom the old in the thick of the fight bear a refuge in mind what know you which side will the victory find 
when you see that your army has lost in the strife, alone do not cast to the wind your sweet life. Should your place be the border, make running your care, and if in the middle the foe's raiment wear. If you number two thousand, two hundred your foe, when night has arrived from his climb you should go. At night fifty horsemen from lying in wait, like five hundred a noise on the ground will create. When you wish to accomplish some marches by night, first look for the ambushes hidden from sight. When one of two armies has marched for a day, the strength from his hands will have dwindled away. At your leisure the army exhausted attack, for the fool has himself placed a load on his back. When you have vanquished your foe, do not lower your flag, lest again he should gather his forces and brag. In pursuit of the fugitives, go not too far, for you should not lose sight of your comrades in war. When the air from war's dust, like a cloud to you shows, around you, with spears and with swords, they will close. From searching for plunder, the soldier refrains, who alone at the back of the monarch remains. To an army, the duty of guarding the king is better than fight in the battlefield's ring. Of Saadi's journey to Hindustan and the depravity of idolatry. An ivory idol I saw at Somnut, begemmed as in paganish times was Monat. So well had the sculptor its features designed that an image more perfect no mortal could find. Caravans from each district were moving along. To look at that spiritless image they throng, kings of China and Chigil, like Sadi, forsooth, from that hard-hearted idol were longing for truth. Men of eloquence, gathered from every place, were beseeching in front of that dumb idol's face. I was helpless to clear up the circumstance, how the animate would to the inanimate bow. To a pagan with whom I had something to do, a companion, well-spoken, a chum of mine, too. I remarked in a whisper, O oh, Brahmin so wise, at the scenes in this place they experienced surprise. About this helpless form they are crazed in their mind, and in error's deep pit are as captives confined. Its hands have no strength, and its feet have no pace, and if thrown on the ground, twould not rise from its place. Don't you see that its eyes are but amber, let in? To seek for good faith in the blind is a sin. That friend at my speech to an enemy turned. He seized me, and, fire-like, from anger he burned. He told all the pagans and temple old men. I saw not my welfare in that meeting then. Since the crooked road seemed unto them to be right, the straight road very crooked appeared in their sight. For although a good man may be pious and wise, he's an ignorant fool in the ignorant's eyes. I was helpless to aid as a man being drowned, except in abasement no method I found. When you see that a fool has malevolence shown, resignation and meekness give safety alone. The chief of the Brahmins I praised to the skies, of the Zend and Asta, oh, expounder most wise, with his idol's appearance I'm satisfied too, for the face and the features are charming to view. Its figure appears very choice in my sight, but regarding the truth I am ignorant quite. I am here as a traveller a very short while, and a stranger knows seldom the good from the vile. You're the queen of the chessboard, and therefore aware, and the monarch's adviser of this temple fair. To worship by mimicking, doubtless, is wrong. Oh, happy the pilgrim whose knowledge is strong! What truths in the figure of this idol lie, for the chief of its worshippers truly am I. The face of the old Brahmin glowed with delight. He was pleased, and said, O oh, thou, whose statements are right, your question is proper, your action is wise, whoever seeks truth will to happiness rise. Like yourself, too, on many a journey I've been, and idols not knowing themselves I have seen, save this, which each morning, just where it now stands, to the great God of justice upraises its hands, and if you are willing, remain the night here, and tomorrow the secret to you will be clear. At the chief Brahmin's bidding I tarried all night, in the well of misfortune, like Bitzhuns my plight.
the night seemed as long as the last judgment day the pagans unwashed round me feigning to pray the priests very carefully water did shun the armpits like carrion exposed in the sun perhaps a great sin i had done long before that i on that night so much punishment bore all the night i was racked in this prison of grief with one hand on my heart one in prayer for relief when the drummer with suddenness beat his loud drum and the cock crowed the fate of the brahmin to come unresisted the black-coated preacher the knight drew forth from his scabbard the sword of daylight on this tinder the morning fire happened to fall and the world in a moment was brilliant to all you'd have said that all over the country of zang from a corner the tartars had suddenly sprung the pagans depraved with unpurified face came from door street and plain to the worshipping place the city and lanes were of people bereft in the temple no room for a needle was left i was troubled from rage and from sleeplessness dazed when the idol its hands upward suddenly raised all at once from the people there rose such a shout you'd have said that the sea in a rage had boiled out when the temple became from the multitude free the brahmin all smiles gazed intently at me i am sure that your scruples have vanished he said truth has made itself manifest falsehood has fled when i saw he was slave to an ignorant whim and that fancies absurd were established in him respecting the truth i no more could reveal for from scoffers tis proper the truth to conceal when you find yourself under a tyrant's command it would scarcely be manly to break your own hand i wept for a time that he might be deceived and said at the statement i made i am grieved at my weeping the pagan's heart's merciful proved is it strange that a stone by the torrent is moved in attendance they ran to me very much pleased and in doing me honour my hands they all seized asking pardon i went to the image of bone in a chair made of gold on a teak timber throne a kiss to the hand of the idol i gave saying curse it and every idolatrous slave a pagan i was for a while in a name in discussing that zend i a brahmin became when myself one of trust in the temple i found i could scarcely from joy keep myself on the ground i fastened the door of the temple one night and scorpion-like ran to the left and the right all under and over the throne i then pried and a curtain embroidered with gold i espied a fire temple prelate in rear of the screen with the end of a rope in his hands could be seen the state of affairs i at once saw aright like david when steel grew like wax in his sight for of course he has only the rope to depress when the idol upraises its hands for redress ashamed was the brahmin at seeing my face for to have any secret exposed a disgrace he bolted and i in pursuit of him fell and speedily tumbled him into a well for i knew that the brahmin escaping alive to compass my death would incessantly strive and were i dispatched he would happiness feel lest living i might his base secret reveal when you know of the business a villain has planned put it out of his power when he falls to your hand for if to that blackguard reprieve you should give he will not desire that you longer should live when at service he places his head at your gate if he can he will surely your head amputate your feet in the track of a cheat do not place if you do and discover him show him no grace i dispatch the impostor with stones without dread for tales are not told by a man when he's dead when i found that i caused a disturbance to spread i abandoned that country and hastily fled if a fire in a cane break you cause to rise look out for the tigers therein if you're wise the young of a man biting snake do not slay if you do in the same dwelling place do not stay when you've managed a hive full of bees to excite run away from the spot or you'll suffer their spite 
at one sharper than you don't an arrow dispatch when you've done it your skirt in your teeth you should catch no better advice sardi's pages contain when a wall's undermined do not near it remain i travelled to sind after that judgment day by yemen and mecca i thence took my way from the whole of the bitterness fate made me meet my mouth till to-day has not shown itself sweet by the aiding of bulbak assad's fortune fair whose like not a mother has borne nor will bear from the sky's cruel hardness for justice i sought in this shadow diffuser a refuge i got like a slave for the empire i fervently pray o oh god cause this shadow for ever to stay he applied not the salve to my wounds need alone but becoming the bounty and favour his own meet thanks for his favours when could i repeat even if in his service my head changed to feet when these miseries passed i experienced joy yet some of the subjects my conscience annoy one is when the hand of petition and praise to the shrine of the knower of secrets i raise the thoughts of that puppet of china arise and cover with dust my self-valuing eyes i know that the hand i stretched forth to the shrine was not lifted by any exertion of mine men of sanctity do not their hands upward bring but the powers unseen pull the end of the string opes the doors of devotion and well-doing still every man has not power a good work to fulfil this same is a bar for a court to repair is improper except the king's order you bear no man can the great key of destiny own for absolute power is the maker's alone hence o travelling man on the straight path divine the favour is god the creator's not thine since unseen he created your mind pure and wise from your nature no action depraved can arise the same who has poison produced in the snake the sweetness produced by the bee too did make when he wished to change to a desert your land he first makes the people distressed at your hand and should his compassion upon you descend to the people through you he will comfort extend that you walk the right road do not boast i advise for the fates took your hand and you managed to rise by these words you will benefit if you attend you will reach pious men if their pathway you wend you will get a good place if the fates are your guide on the table of honour rich fare they'll provide and yet tis not right that you eat all alone for the poor helpless dervish some thought should be shown End of Selections from Bustan or the Garden of Perfume End of a Selection from the Poetry of Saadi Shirazi Edited by Nathan Haskell Dole and Bell Walker Recording by Algie Pug